I'm going to start introductions um, and then kind of ease in so that as people kind of gather late before we really start talking about anything too juicy. Um, my name's Tara. I work for a pop culture classroom um, and I have been a nerd since I was knee high to a grasshopper um, and I love making characters. Oh, I love making characters. I have notebooks full of elf quest characters and sailor moon characters and i built myself up into what i hope to be a pretty good character creator um and now i make my own original comics and and help kids through pop culture classroom which is hopefully who you're here through um and if you haven't checked us out we have a lot of cool programming while people are trapped in um and even past that um so you should definitely go check it out if you've wandered here some other way um and lesson today um well you don't really need anything to follow along um if you do want to grab a notebook and a pen or if you have a way to take screenshots or anything like that um that might be useful also if you want a sketchbook if in case you get any ideas that's always useful to have if you're an artist um this is going to cover both the creative part of who the character is internally and then how you bring that out to the surface through art and design so we're going to go past or through both levels of that um so let's go ahead and get started so when i was young like i said i love 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 making characters and i think a lot of us start this way you know you start out and like what would it be like if i was at hogwarts and what would it be like if i got to do the sorting hat and that's how I started really getting really creative is making art and stories of these characters. But I was 10, 11, and a lot of them were, uh, they were, they were beginning stages of character designs. They were, you know, the equivalent of the art I was making at 10 or 11. And, and the great thing about these things is the more you do it, the more you grow. And a lot of these things, they start the seed. Like a lot of people will be really 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 mean to the idea of a mary sue and like it's the worst thing ever it's not it's our baby steps to getting involved and building interesting characters um so what is mary sue uh mary sue is a character who is perfect uh they're beautiful they're talented beyond what makes sense for their world they have multiple skills everyone loves them uh possibly everyone loves them depending often on how many cute guys or girls are in the phantom uh a lot of times they represent a lot of what we internally want to experience through this fantasy world um and a lot of times they have a lot of problems with editing so they're all those things at once they're the best dancer and the best uh sewer and the best fencer and the best thief and everyone adores them everything all just piled on but one thing about mary sue's is these characters also could easily be qualified as mary sue's they have things in their past that are tragic that define them in certain ways they're always at the right place at the right time they have special skills that no one else has often for no real apparent reason than they're the main character uh they're special and a lot of these are some of my favorite characters hopefully some of your favorite characters maybe maybe some not so much they're characters from all sorts of different media they're all very popular characters so a lot of those ideas that we start out with those characters that we love as they grow it's not about getting out of those habits it's about refining those habits and editing them and learning where self-indulgence is indulgence for everyone and what makes a character interesting versus what makes them hard to connect to so some of the things that you want to shy away from that make a character hard to relate to is again being perfect no one is perfect you know we relate to Naruto because he messes up we relate to luke skywalker because 
whether we want to admit it or not, all of us were once bored teenagers who wanted to get away from the moisture farm. You know, we relate to Sailor Moon because we all have klutzy moments where we make mistakes and make selfish choices. And one of the things about those is we relate to those things as real flaws. It's not like, oh, so-and-so has a flaw. They're too kind, and so people take advantage of them. Like, that can be a flaw, but you want something that people can relate to. Like, Harry Potter is one of my favorite characters, and one of the reasons I love him most is because he is headstrong. And sometimes that is one of his best characteristics, and it what's really drive him as the protagonist. Sometimes you flip that over and it's very bad for him and gets him into a lot of trouble because someone can easily bait him to plow forward no matter what. So these are the kind of things that you want is it's not that you want to be like, oh, okay, I don't want to make a Mary Sue so my character's not interesting and they don't do anything special. You just want to think about what in what you're making fleshes them out? What kind of specialness are valid? For example, it totally makes sense that Naruto is a special person in a world full of special people. If Bella Swan could suddenly do Shadow no Jutsu, that would be really weird for her world. So what balances into their world? What is interesting? How do you flesh them out as more than just a type of character you know what makes them more than just the good guy or the sidekick the girlfriend um what makes them more than a perfect person who has no flaws and never messes anything up where is that going to give you room to make a story around them where is that going to be giving you room for them to make mistakes and grow as a character over your story so when you think about those things, you've got to make sure your character is totally balanced. Um, I, and one of the biggest Mary Sue's, which ironically connected to this, I would definitely say, or canon Sue's, as they call them, Kirk. Kirk always wins the fight. He always has the solution. He's charming. He always gets the girl. He always charms everyone into a solution he always wins the fight but he's still a very compelling character a very classic character so it's all about balancing them out um so once you start thought about kind of how just a person is interesting as a character and that kind of balance how do we make the whole character because like all right so i'm gonna make a balanced character now what? I am assuming that to some extent you may have a story already going or you may have a character that you've already thought about, already have pieces of. Um, maybe it's a, a, an original character that you're trying to shape into something or an original character from something you love that you're trying to shape into an original content. Maybe it's something original that you are trying to make right now while we're all stuck inside and flesh out. Um, and there are tons of ways to come to making a character and making a story. So we're going to go through one of them today. Um, but I definitely don't want you to think like, oh, okay, every time I need to make a character, I'm going to bust out this whole thing and do it this step, this step, this step. It doesn't work that way. Creativity doesn't work that way. Um, you may have a story that pretty much, if you're lucky, drops into your lap and all the characters tell you about themselves and you don't barely have to do any world building or character building. Pardon me. You may also wake up with a vague concept from a dream that won't leave you alone and you have to build everything from scratch around this one visual. Or you may meet a person that just stays in the back of your head and something about them tells a story to you and you have to figure out what that story is. 
So I don't want you to get in your head like, ah, yes, Miss Tara, she said, who, what, when, where, why, how, and every time I want to get creative, I have to write an essay about, no, no, this is just a way to think about it. And probably when you're doing it, you're going to have like, who and where come to mind automatically and why fills itself in and maybe you just need to pause and think about how or maybe you come about it in an entirely different way and this this doesn't work for your story but it's a really good tool to have in your toolbox and a lot of creativity whether it's art writing anything you do it's gonna all be about putting tools into your toolbox. Sometimes they won't work for you. Sometimes you might use them once in your life. Sometimes you'll find yourself being like, I hate that, and then you use it every day. Sometimes the opposite. You'll find you like, ah, oh, I'm gonna get this and it's gonna be the most useful thing, and you use it once. So you just wanna build that toolbox as you go. And we'll talk about that a little bit later because that toolbox comes in really handy with character design because character design is a lot of times tapping into what we call our visual library, which is a very big tool in your toolbox. And I'll, um, I'll if we get a little chance, I'll show you. I use Pinterest a lot for mine, uh, but visual library is just a term for having access to a lot of visual references. So if you were doing a story set in the ocean, you might build a visual library uh, around sea creatures and coral reefs and boats and uh, storms at sea and things like that. Um, but it's also something that as an artist or creator or anything like that, you always just kind of want to be seeing things and building these visual things. Because I may not be building a story around the ocean now, but if I get a chance to go for 10 bucks on a tour of a submarine and take a whole bunch of reference pictures, in 15 years, those pictures might be invaluable. So that's the kind of thing you want always to be building into this toolbox and this visual um, library that you have. And some people do it by literally like clipping out pictures. Like I said, I use Pinterest a lot, although I do have a physical one. I use my phone a lot. Um, and this also can apply to things bigger than visuals. This can apply to things like TV you know, stories you've read, classic literature you've read, science things you know, um, historical knowledge you know. This is why as a creator it's really important to be well read and well learned and well hold out so that your characters can be. Because if I need to make a character who lived in 1910 Germany I've got to have a starting base to know where to even start poking around on Wikipedia and what that even starts to look like. Um, or if I'm doing someone living 3,000 years in the future, if I know a little bit about science and a little bit about sci-fi that's already out there that exists, I'm still going to make my own thing and I still get to make up a lot of my own rules, but I have a reference for where those rules come from. Um, if I know how the concept of gravity works as much as the next guy. Um, then when I make up a planet, I can make gravity that feels real, real for people, even though it's a totally fake planet. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and build our specific character. So for this, we're gonna build one character for a story, and then we're gonna talk about how we make that character look. So I've already kind of picked out because it's a uh, where back and forth seemed a little bit hard to do. So I'm going to go ahead and lead through and I have made sort of this idea of a character partially and then we'll fill her out while we go. Um, and we'll talk about what these different things kind of mean. So the first thing I want to talk about is who is your character and who can cover a lot of things. So who can cover statistics? What age are they? How tall are they? Um, where, what ethnicity do they come from? If that's relevant to your world, what species are they? If that's relevant to your world, what planet are they from? Um, what faith do they have? What place did they grow up? Are they rich? Are they poor? Stuff that's just, you know, yes, no kind of factual stuff. Um, it can also include things more in depth about that. Are they, fa do they have a faith? How, close are they to it? You know, like Star Wars, Jedis have their faith. 
Are they very devout Jedis or do they barely believe it exists? Um, who also covers things like what do they do in their spare time? What do they like and dislike? Um, what makes them want to be friends with a person or trust them? Um, and this, all of these can go very, very deep or very shallow. And one of the things when you're thinking about creating that you always want to have in your head is almost everything is going to be on a scale. And I'll throw a couple different things up on the scale. So our first one is going to be deep versus shallow. So with most of these scale things, you want to think that you want to balance. So if my character is my main character and my story is going to be 20 volumes long, I want to go pretty dang deep with how much I know who they are. If my story is one page and it has 20 characters in it, I can be probably pretty shallow with each one it is. Most projects and most characters are going to kind of survive in this middle world. And that's going to be true with a lot of things. And it's going to be true with all different projects. Um, everything you're going to go, you're going to go back and forth between where you invest time, where you don't, what you put a lot of energy into and what you don't. So for this, our character that we're just making for a class, who's probably not going to go too far beyond three o'clock this afternoon, we're not going to go too, too deep. So I'm going to say she is a young, suspicious, but hopeful girl. All right. So that doesn't tell you everything about this character, right? Well, these other things are going to start revealing other, other spots. One second to take a drink. Uh, all right. So the next part, so we know who they are. What are they? This is going to go a couple ways. You have both the what are they to you in the story? Are they the hero? Are they a side character? Um, are they a one scene throw off character? Which helps you kind of figure out how much energy are you going to put into them? You spend five hours planning out the backstories of every henchman that shows up in every page of your comic. That's not going to be very good time management for making your comic. <laughs> so you want to think about that. And in this, she's going to be the main character because she's the only one. <laughs> Actually, she won't be by the end. Um, but because of that, she is also, in our case, in the story, going to be the hero. So what they are can also mean what are they in the story? Are they the hero? Are they the one causing the problems? Are they an anti-hero? Which means somebody who does the right thing in maybe a messy way. Um, so what role does she play in the story? Is she a love interest? Is she the betrayer? There's all sorts of different archetypes that you can build. Um, let's see. And she is going to be an unwilling hero. So in this stage, if you're starting from scratch, sometimes just throwing something at the wall, if you have no preference about how the story is going to go, how this character is going to go, throwing something like unwilling, hopeful, you don't necessarily have to know what those things mean. Throwing in things like that can start building the character itself. If there is no template that yet, putting down the world hopeful is how I start building the character. Now, if you have a world or idea in mind, that's going to influence it, but it shouldn't necessarily dominate it. So hopeful can be a term for many people and I don't want you to get in the mindset of oh if I have a post-apocalyptic story nobody can be hopeful your character should be who they are no matter what setting they're in so they do affect each other but then this is again the scale person versus nature I guess nature versus society where do, oh, I moved away from that so fast. Um, how much of who they are and how much of the world they're in. So our girl, we're going to say she's in 
I'm going to give you guys a spoiler because we haven't quite got there yet. A fantastical desert where s rations are scarce. Um, so she's suspicious, but she has a lot of hope. Um, when? So. When? Oh, haha. <laughs> sorry, my notes had where first. When is the time in the story? So because this character is the hero, she would be in all of the story, or primarily most of it. Um, oh, sorry, I wrote it in the wrong place after all that. Because I flipped them. Um, but this is also a way to keep track of while you're keeping your notes and organizing your story, do they show up in chapter two? Are they a reoccurring background character? Are they a reoccurring main character? Um, especially gets useful the bigger and bigger your story you have so for like us who are making a character who's just probably going to be here it's not as important when she shows up um but it is uh important when you're organizing a bigger larger story um when can also although this here i left it separate it can tie into where so where is the setting for this story and this is going to affect your character a lot because it's where they live um if our character grew up in like i said a fantasy desert with scarce resources this shapes who she is as a person um it's going to shape when we move into the visual what she looks like what she wears how she accessorizes um possibly even things like how it has affected her body for example a desert tends to either be darker skinned people because even if i lived in the desert eventually i would get to be darker skinned um uh um you would do all these different sorts of things depending on the location. Um, if you have creatures in the ocean, they're going to be fish-like or squid-like. Um, whatever you do, those are going to be the biggest thing that defines the appearance of the person past who they are, is where they live, what's available for them to wear, what makes sense for them to wear, um, what shapes their, their personality and their behaviors and things like that um next we have why so why is a character's motivations why do they do what they do it's going to be i mean all these kind of obviously interlay with each other um but it's going to be one of those things that really emphasizes a lot of who they are and it's going to be formed a lot by where they are and a lot of times also by what they are um motivation is something like batman is a superhero because someone killed his parents or superman is a superhero because he believes in goodness um and and that he has a responsibility with the powers he's given so those are very two different very very different motivations of characters in the same world who work together um, so we're going to say that our character's motivation is survival at the start of the story. And one of the reasons I mentioned at the start of the story is right now we are making this person in a vacuum. So while well, we know things like she lives in a fantasy desert, um, she has motivation of survival, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know everything about her yet. We don't know where she's going to be. We don't know what she's going to earn through the story or gather through the story or learn through the story. So when you're starting to define a character, you are only defining them from the story backwards to start with. You don't have to as much worry about who they are going to be. Now, hopefully, once you get started, you might have, uh, I shouldn't say hopefully, I guess that really depends on your creative process but most people before they they actually start page one have an idea of where they're going to go from there but right now you want to focus on who they are right now and why are they that person right now um so right now we're going to say that she's motivated to survive and this is because of the how so the how is her backstory 
how did she get to this point in time? So I'm saying I used to live out in the desert when I was a kiddo, and a lot of the business back there was mining. Um, but a lot of the mining was really risky because the part of the desert I lived in, it was all uh, very like gold and silver and very high precious stuff and a lot of unsafe conditions and a lot of um, backstabbing back in the Old West. So I'm going to use that experience that I have and work that into her backstory and say that her father was lost in a mining accident. Do, do, do. and that she is the eldest sibling so she scavenges and hunts to protect your family all right so now I have this rough idea of this character to get started. And man, I realized we haven't even named her. Mm -hmm. Let's name her. I'm going to name her Thistle. I don't know why. I was going to name her Sage, but that felt a little on the nose. So she's Thistle. All right. So now... Let's go ahead and let's start using this, now that we have an idea of who Thistle is, to start designing her. So, can I say goodbye to Ensign Sue and our Canon Sue's? Goodbye, Kirk. All right. Let's just focus on our own characters. So we're going to think about a couple more scales here while we think about our artistic style. And the first one I want you guys to think about is detail versus simple. So, for, oh, I shouldn't have gotten rid of it. I wonder if I can still... Ooh, let's yeah, okay, yeah, here, let's do it over here, though. Cancel, undo that, ha-ha, <laughs> technology. Okay, so, detailed. This is the most detailed that we can probably currently get with technology. Or you could argue maybe oil paintings are a little bit more detailed. Um, photographic, real, is as detailed as you can get. On the other end, this is about as simple as you get. Classic smiley face. And this is on a people scale, right? So when you're thinking about your art style and the project you're making, you're gonna decide between how detailed and how simple it's gonna be. And there's many things that go into this. What's your style? Who is it made for? If, you know, Kids might want bright colors and simpler shapes, whereas a triple A video game is going to want to have really sleek, very super high graphic details. Um, your budget, you may not be, you may want those super high graphic details, but you may have to compromise down. What can you realistically make? Um, the length of it, which kind of goes into budget. If I'm funding a long web comic on my own, I have to par my style down so that I can afford to make a lot more of it versus if someone is paying me and I can spend hours on each page, um, I can put a lot more detail into it. So there's a lot that will go into detail versus simple. Um, there's also the choice of what you are making. Something like Adventure Time would not work in a lot of different styles. If Adventure Time was real or animated hyper-realistic like Final Fantasy, it would not be the same story. <laughs> it's time for a stretch break. A very good reminder to have if you are a stay-at-home artist. Thank you, Alexa. Um, all right. Um, so what style is going to best match your story? So with this in mind, I think I want, I'm doing this kind of like desert fantasy. So it's harsh. But I don't necessarily want it to be, like, dreary. I want there still to be, like, 
colors in it. And I already know that she's kind of a tough person. So I'm going to go, and I maybe cheated a little bit, but in the way you should cheat, I designed a character and an idea that I think already matches my style pretty well. And that, well, I just called it cheating, is absolutely not cheating and what you should do. Because if you're making your thing, it should be what you should be making, what you love, what matches your style, not what I should be making, not what Eric or Matt should be making. They should be making what matches their style and their passions and their knowledge. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep it kind of medium simple because I've got about 20 minutes or so to draw her so I can put some detail in. Um, and I think for the storyline and enough detail to kind of explain what I'm doing is important. Um, the next thing, which is, uh, or the next thing you want to think about is the visual hierarchy of the character. So visual hierarchy means basically making what is important look important. So if my character, if I want everyone to know that she really, really likes, oh, let me find something totally inappropriate for this character. She really, really likes sync. I have to tell people that because it is not going to be apparent if this is important to the story. So if this is important to the story, if maybe she's going to save this fantasy desert world with her passion of in sync, and that's important, I want to put it high on my visual hierarchy. So I might do something like, I'm sorry, this probably does not match any remotely realistic. It's fantasy in sync. Here, it'll be. Uh, tin seek <laughs> oh that's a terrible pun i'm sorry you guys i'm sorry my my bad pun thing is just broken okay so if it's important for her to know and love tin seek and i need everyone to know this i have to let the viewer know automatically and one of the cool things but also one of the uh kind of scary intimidating things about art is every line that you draw can be used to communicate and as so much in your power you want to use every bit of space to communicate something so like i have not even gotten far in this character and you can tell some things about her she has the weight to go around and, and, and hunt for her family. She's not going to be pushed around. She has an attitude. And she loves Tin Sink. All right. So what else do we need to know about her? Well, let's see what else is in her story. What else can I show? And while I'm thinking about those things and thinking about how every line communicates, I also want to think of... See, I mixed up reality. This should have been <laughs> reality versus abstract. <laughs> what I talked about with the picture and the smiley face. And then actual detail versus simple is thinking about if you are doing this character, how detailed do you want them to be? How often are you going to be redrawing them? How often are you going to be um, recreating them? Are you going to be having other people draw this character? Um, budget in comes into this. Can you afford to have them animated with 4,000 trinkets on their body? Um, is it a good idea? Is it going to read clearly what those things are? Um, it's also thinking about, is she a person who carries a lot on her? Is she a person who, um, is she a person who has, so she's a scavenger, right? So she obviously has to carry stuff. I 
haven't gotten a lot of fantasy in here though, right? So let's think what could make this fantasy. Whoa, who says she has to be human? Maybe she's, if it's a desert, maybe she's a little jackalope girl. Yes, yes, okay, so that lets people know this is not a human world anymore. Mm -hmm. And you notice while I'm doing this that stuff is changing as I go, and that's really important. You should be flexible to changing your idea. You should be comfortable with putting a lot of different ideas down on paper, trying out different things. Sometimes your first idea will be the one you keep coming back to. Sometimes you'll unlock something better. Sometimes you'll unlock something that you kind of end up combining in that kind of is a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. But trying different things, seeing what sticks, kind of like we talked about before, can help you figure out how to make these interesting characters and not stay in a rut of making the same type over and over again. Um, is is just, you know... If you draw, if I say she's going to be a jackalope girl and then I challenge myself to design 10 rugged, jackalope, suspicious, hopeful, survival, scavenger looks, by idea 9 or 10, I'm going to be pushed out of my box. And I'll know whether the first box was the right one to be in or not. All right. So I think she should be a scavenger, like I said. So she shouldn't have a lot of hair in her face, so... Maybe that, maybe I might test and see how like, a, oh yeah, like a side, see? I think an undercut would be really good for a jackalope girl because like, then it would be out of her way and off of her ears and her, they have a little like, yeah, okay, so she's going to have an undercut, her bunny ears. So see, there's a perfect example. The first idea I had was like short and shaggy. And that makes sense, but I think this one works better. All right. Uh, just wearing a t-shirt in the apocalypse isn't very interesting. And I bet it would get messed up anyway. Oh, I didn't say she's apocalypse. I said she's fantasy. But never mind. But now it's short. I like that. Okay, um, what else would you do if you were scavenging? Do you have something you could easily move in, right? Maybe like lots of protection on your legs. Maybe like, oh, but it's a desert. Maybe like, oh, oh, I know what she should definitely have. How did I not think of a cape or a poncho yet? Oh, my God. Whenever ponchos are an option, you should definitely go for ponchos. Oh, but it covers up a little bit. Okay, it just covers up the bad pun part, though. Haha, <laughs> bye. <laughs> yeah, whenever capes or ponchos are an option, you should always take them. Really fun. All right. So some other things you want to think about is um, shapes and silhouettes that are in them. So these two things are interconnected. And before we get into her, her face too much, I kind of want to talk about this. So this kind of goes two ways. Um, silhouette is the outside of a character. And... How recognizable that character is just from seeing their silhouette with no identifying markings besides just that black silhouette. And how easy is it to identify them? This is either Batman or Finn the Human. I can't tell which. No, oh, same difference. So that is the silhouette. Now, silhouettes are obviously a little bit easier if you're doing like SpongeBob over here. Let me up his sponge. 
where you're using these huge, ridiculous, you know, or I guess, I mean, a square is not ridiculous, but these big, bold, sketchy, or um, cartoony kind of exaggerated shapes. So if that's your style, you want to think a little bit more about silhouettes. Um, if you have a more realistic style, when you can think about silhouettes, it's really awesome because it's not to do some others that maybe run a little bit more realistic. It's not that silhouettes can't be recognizable in more humanoid things. And I mean, I'm sure we've all seen stickers on the back of um, nerds' cars, and you can tell when it's Steven Universe, it's easier to recognize than when it's Sailor Moon, which is still easier to recognize than when you get to people who have Princess Leia or um, X-Files or something like that on there. The closer you get to realistic proportions, it's not impossible, but it gets harder to define the silhouette. Um, so if you can find a way, like ours actually has these pretty cool little horns and these ears that her silhouette would be pretty recognizable that's awesome that said sometimes silhouettes don't really matter for what you're doing in that case layered on that is shape so a good silhouette is made of good shapes spongebob for instance is such a good example he is a square and he's kind of got that cornered and it's super iconic this square shape he has right um i'm not necessarily going to have access to that in a person right but say I wanted to communicate to you that someone was square, stick in the mud, lawful good to lawful evil because all they care about is the lawful, never steps a toe outside of the law, square, square person. I could go ahead and I could start building them using square shapes and using those squares to kind of let you know how uncomfortable they are and that they don't want anyone to touch them and they don't want anything near them because they're very rigid and very hard and like as i go and let me do this really fast. i can do this really fast there we go as i go i might start taking that and yeah they're gonna become oh it's got to automatically say clip paint studio clip studio paint by the way is what i've been using and it is a super great program um i'm gonna soften it into a person but i might really keep that square kind of and again how much you stylize it is going to depend on your style and what you're working on oh you can see my terrible lines all over the place my Cintiq is very, very old. You know, a Pixar short can do a lot more stylization and put a lot more energy into it than maybe a Netflix reality show. But you, you, you choose whatever's most appropriate for you and your project. All right, so shapes. Um, another really good example of shapes, a very classic good example that most of you know is Look at all these very spiky, dangerous shapes on this character. Wow. He's probably not someone who is very friendly and welcoming. He is probably dangerous. Like, look at that. And that is such a good classic example of using shapes. Is this like Batman just everything about his shape gives off unfriendly, dangerous, sharp kind of vibes. Um, and that's really what I think... A, I mean, the 90s TV show style is so successful for a lot of ways, but it leans so much into that stylization and that use of shape um, that it was very, very successful. And its character designs were very, very successful because they, they leaned into that idea so much. So what can we do with that? Oh, there we go. Well, I have started making a lot of round shapes, so I'm going to stick with that because that is my style. Very round all right what else have i let's see so she hunts to protect her siblings so let's go ahead 
And we're going to add a charm bracelet for all the siblings. My stabilization is way too up. This picture is quite messy, but while you're doing character design, you should keep it quick and messy because, like I said, you're going to be wanting to do a lot of different variations real quick and try things out and see what works and see what doesn't work. And usually I don't actually, this is one of the things I love my digital, but I almost always do character design in a sketchbook because it feels like it gives me a lot more freedom and stuff to like make choices and try out different things and see what works and try something else, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So we now have this charm bracelet that is her siblings all little trinkets of them so if she gets stressed out she can look at them um and some of these things uh all of these things actually the trinkets the the um t-shirt all of it character design is character development so every little thing i add into her design tells you something about her the way she wears her hair the fact that she has made the correct fashion choice to have a cape the fact that she loves this band, Tin Sink. Um, the fact that she carries this charm necklace or this charm bracelet around with her siblings. All of these, as soon as they come into existence, are now part of her character development at all because it means not only does this bracelet exist, she is a person who cares about her siblings, that she wants to keep them with her, that she shows it in the way of wearing jewelry or charms. All of those tell you about her. Um, it would be slightly different if she, say, remembered them all by getting them tattooed on her. Or if she didn't want any memories of them because she wanted to keep her head clear while she was out scavenging and focus on what she's doing. So that's where all this comes in. Alright, and now we're going to make her face. And I've kind of left the face to last. I want her and also if you guys have any any questions this kind of last call go ahead and drop them in the chat and look at them to me um in the last couple of minutes like I said I want her to be young suspicious but she's still hopeful actually looks kind of like a bad girl right now I'm going to say she definitely has a couple scars from scavenging. I think what else she might have in the desert. This definitely has a hood so she can pull it up and get shade. Oh, she needs like a, even without her backpack, I think she'd have like a water pouch. This is a fantasy world. She can have like pouch skins on both sides. Yeah. All right. And if this was a real character I was making for realsies, I would have done about five more of these and figured out what I like best and tried a lot more stuff if she was going to stick around for more than the next 10 minutes or so. Um, and then the last thing you want to think about is if you were making something in color, what colors are they? Um, this also can help be used to support the rest of your world. And this is also going to be a lot more about your world building. Um, but world building and character building aren't disconnected. Um, so is it something like, you know, we talked about Adventure Time where it's really, really bright colors. Or I said I wanted to do some like, let's see, be like here. No, that wouldn't be good. That would be a very poor choice for your...
All right. And there we have Thistle, the tin sink loving jackalope desert scavenger from a, she's a desert fairy, I guess. I did not get as much fantasy as I would have liked in there. And hopefully this helped y'all. That's the quickest background I've ever drawn. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, oh, I made it too quick. And so, um, let's see. I talked about building your visual library. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about that a little bit more. One of my favorite ways to do that. Oh, don't look. Oh, wait, that's just. Um, is this website Pinterest? Um, and Pinterest is just really, really good. Most of it's just sharing these images over and over again. And so, like, you can really do, um, you know, explore an idea and when you like something, build these visual libraries. So this is built around the idea of a dandelion based character. And so I just saved pictures of anything that reminded me of that or of dandelions or interesting looking visual dandelion things. And now I can go back and look at this. And the nice thing about Pinterest is you can build boards and boards within boards so you could have a character in their wardrobe and you know what things they like looking at and and you know things in their world and that sort of thing so this is a really good way to build up that visual library but just in general keep your keep your brain always open to listening to what is going on around you and looking at things because all of those ideas all of that knowledge can be used later on if you're creative to build these characters and flesh them out, balance them out, make them fully rounded characters. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. It looks like we don't have any questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this for now. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I know we're doing a whole bunch of these and I think I'm doing another one in like a week or two. I'll go ahead and put the information out for you wherever you found this. So thank you so much, stay safe. Um, be creative, uh, and I hope everybody is doing well. <laughs>